So, um, my topic is BPF programmable net devices. Um, so the goal for this talk is really um, that I said to myself, like how can we achieve the lowest possible networking overhead for network namespaces? Kubernetes pods, they are basically, you can view them as network namespaces. And how can we get there? So if you look at the typical Kubernetes data path architecture, um, nothing optimized, default being meaning the most compatible with also all the kernels. Uh, the way it basically looks like you have the host, there's kubelet running, there's kubeproxy component running, um, then you have a pod which you can regard as network namespace. It has weave devices connected. And if you use Cilium as a CNI, there's basically a Cilium agent and a Cilium CNI plugin. That CNI plugin itself is basically like a standalone binary, uh, which is called from the kubelet when a pod is being added. Um, and it will basically create devices. It will, uh, it, it, it has some IPAN management. It will assign IP addresses, routes, uh, and so on, and then move them into the target network namespace. And then it will basically have an RPC call to the Cilium agent telling, okay, this process is complete. And then the Cilium agent can move on and, for example, assign BPF programs and so on and so forth to do the rest of the endpoint management. Um, the Cilium agent itself uh, is typically deployed as a daemon set in Kubernetes, and that's uh, sharing the host network namespace. Uh, so that's in the kube system. And yeah. Um, so what you can see here is like uh, the routing is done through the upper stack. And there may be some reasons why you stick to this. Um, for example, for, re for regular users, they start out with, okay, like I just deployed it with the defaults and that's the way it looks. Or for some reason, they cannot replace your proxy component um, or they have custom net filter rules. So then they need to go with this. Um, what problems are with this kind of architecture. So kubeproxy is basically there to implement Kubernetes services. Uh, and if you deploy many services, that's basically like services are basically the main communication uh, thing because they have like fixed uh, IP addresses as opposed to pods, pods they can churn, uh, come and go. So all the communication happens in, t in Kubernetes typically through services. So then you can get like really long uh, list of IP table rules. And this can be a scalability issue. Um, that's one thing. Um, in case of Cilium, I'm not talking about this today, but uh, this has been covered in previous LPC uh, conferences. Uh, we have a BPF-based replacement uh, for uh, kubeproxy. Um, interesting, interestingly, at the last week's KubeCon, uh, some of the SIG networking folks from Kubernetes angle, they decided that they would that they would move forward with NFT for the uh, Kube proxy component itself. Um, yeah, to basically um, address the scalability issue where you have to walk the linear list. Um, then the other thing that is problematic, if you go to the upper stack, so basically when the packet goes to the host weave device um, on, the, on the ingress, when you logically want to route packets out, uh, you hit the upper stack, and in the upper stack, there's this SKB orphan, um, which is, as I understand, mainly there for NetFilters tproxy. Um, uh, yeah, but that's basically what you hit when you hit the forwarding path, and that's problematic because it breaks TCP back pressure uh, because it would evade the send buff limits. And if you look at performance, so basically we have here like a... Uh, node to node over wire, um, that's basically the yellow bar uh, where you hit for a single TCP stream flow 100 gigabit. Um, then how does it look if you do pod to pod routing over wire? Um, then you hit 63 gigabits because mainly because of the TCP uh, back pressure breakage. So yeah, the, the question became, um, how can we improve that? How can we reduce this overhead? Um, so one thing we did in Cilium, which has been a while back now, uh, but I thought I mentioned it here for context, is BPF host routing. Um, so basically the idea is um, 
add two new helpers to BPF and let them route uh, inside the host through the TC BPF layer. Um, for the ingress side, there's this BPF redirect peer helper where the packet basically um, arrives on the physical NIC on the TC ingress and it rewrites the device pointers to the device that is inside the pod to this peer device and it does another loop through the main receive loop and then basically we are already in the target network namespace. So this allows for a fast uh, net and S switch on the ingress side. Um, those are basically the details. We fetch the device pointer from um, from the host facing weave to get to the peer. Uh, we scrub the packet, we reset the device pointer, and then we do this this, this loop and we can avoid we can avoid the per CPU backlog that we otherwise have on the weave device. On the egress side, we basically have um, this helper, which is called BPF redirect neighbor. So you can view it uh, to insert the packet into a neighbor, neighboring subsystem of the stack uh, so that it can resolve the L2 addressing um, without having to care about that. Uh, so it's us utilizing the stack here. And the advantage uh, is that it basically also fixes the TCP break pressure issue because the SKPSK will be retained all the way to the physical device, and then there may be a queue disk. It might it might sit there a little bit in the queue, but then really it gets only the TCP stack gets the notification really once the um, packet has left the node. So that's how the complete picture looks. The nice thing is also that you can reuse the BPF FIP lookup helper, uh, which we do is so we, we utilize the, the all the routing infrastructure uh, from the existing kernel. If you look at the performance benchmarks, how, how this looks like, uh, so that same TCP stream uh, benchmark from part to part now bumped from 63 to, to uh, 90 gigabit per second. So this basically really gives a huge uh, advantage. But one thing is, well, it looks nice, but it's still not on par with the host. Uh, so we really would like to also get to the 100 gigabit. So, there are two components uh, like on that journey, uh, what we added and presented last year at the LPC is not going into details uh, here, is basically a new TC BPF based fast path, which we call TCX. Um, that has been merged on the 6.6 .6 kernel um, and it, re it reduces the, the entry point uh, uh, for TC BPF so that we cut the cycles in half compared to the old style uh, TC attachment. And then the other thing that uh, got added with this was BPF link support, which was missing uh, in the TC infrastructure and which is really crucial, especially if you have multiple um, users on the, on the TC uh, hook so that they don't step over each other. So then the next step after that, this was kind of the prerequisite to get the Netlink work moving forward because the TCX uh, basically had a new um, framework for uh, uh, attaching and describing dependencies. And the same was also needed for NetKit because people would like to add multiple programs and not just a single program to that. So the next thing was basically a new driver uh, which we can use to replace the weave devices with that. Um, and that's basically, that has been merged uh, recently in the merge window. And that's what we are planning to move forward with for the Cilium CNI. So basically when this Cilium CNI plugin that I mentioned earlier sets up the devices, it will create uh, NetKit devices um, instead of the weave ones. And um, the internal program management is handled through this uh, BPF MPROC uh, framework. And the idea is basically to execute that inside the pod at the driver's XMIT routine um, so that this basically allows also like a fast net and S switch on the, e on the logical egress side. Um, yeah, and it also implements the, the NDO get peer dev uh, callback so that you can have both like a fast ingress and fast egress uh, network namespace switch. The devices are configurable as L3. 
uh, with the option to also have L2 if you really need it. Um, and there's a default drop uh, that you can configure if no BPF is attached. So for example, uh, for the device that is inside the port network namespace, that is quite useful. Um, so when the CNI plugin sets up the devices, it can configure that no traffic should be leaked uh, until the point where the actual BPF program is set up from the, from the Cilium agent. And the other thing that was important also was basically to, um, as you can see here, like this, this device pair is like, it has a primary and a peer device and all the management should happen through the primary device. Uh, the primary device is typically in host network namespace um, so that from our side, from Cilium side, we have access to that and we can manage BPF programs for the primary device itself. Uh, for example, if you have policy and whatnot, but also for the peer device. So no application inside a pod should be able to detach or mangle some BPF programs that are sitting on the peer device. So all the management really happens and is enforced through the primary device. So here's how the, the XMIT routine looks like. I mean, the idea is fairly straightforward. Um, you have a default policy. If nothing is attached, uh, the SKB gets, gets uh, scrubbed, then we reset the device pointers to the peer device, uh, which you know implies this network namespace switch, uh, because now the FIP lookup will look up the um, uh, everything under the host uh, network namespace uh, instead of the pods. Same with the BPF redirect when we uh, pick up the, and, and, and look up the devices. Um, then it executes the BPF program array uh, that is active on the node and then depending on the return code there's either uh, this netkit pass um, which is then basically the idea is to push traffic inside the host namespace for local uh, traffic or if you do the netkit redirect it will it, it can then uh, forward the packet directly to the physical device those return codes they are binary compatible with the with the tc bpf side and when the programs run, so they run in a multi-proc array. So there's this mproc for each, uh, which iterates um, over the different attached BPF programs. And again, like the same style. So, so the idea was that we can use the, from Cilium, the BPF programs that we have attached on the uh, host facing weave on Ingress, and we move them um, into the into the peer device of NetKit. So that was the idea. And, and, and then we have this mproc bundle, which you can swap when you update, when you, when you add or remove programs. So a little bit of background. We, in Cilium, we used to have IPVLAN support. Um, not anymore, but um, it was like a limited kind of POC in the past. And back then the idea was basically well, the Cilium CNI plugin sets IPVLAN slave devices. It moves them to the target network namespace. And the way we did that was basically to have a very simple program attached, which has a tail call uh, map with just a single entry. And we moved that, we attached that to the IPVLAN slave device when moving the whole device into the, into the pod. And the tail call map was basically accessible from the host namespace so that the Cilium agent uh, doesn't have to switch network namespaces because we cannot do that because we don't really want to map the, the host procfs into the Cilium container for security reasons. So with that little trick, we, we were basically able to update the BPF program um, from the host that is inside the, the Kubernetes part. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's where we moved our BPF LXC programs that we have in Cilium. There are limitations um, with that. Uh, so for example, the if you're familiar with IPVLAN, so it has an L3 mode. Uh, with the L3 mode, you have the problem that there's net filter asymmetry uh, on the on the logical path into the pod. I think the net filter hook is skipped, but on the egress path, it's not skipped which can lead to problems. For example, in case of Kubernetes, there are some uh, rules where 
a packet becomes or has an unknown state and the connection tracker is basically being dropped. So the problem there is we had to switch to the L3S mode, which means for the logical ingress, in, ingress path into the pod, it has to go up to the net filter subsystem and then from there do the network namespace switch. Um, okay, not the biggest, not the biggest deal, but uh, a problem that uh, that is still there is that when you have BPF programs attached inside the IP VLAN um, slave device, like inside the pod, they could potentially be unloaded by applications. And that's not really what we, what we wanted to have. So we really wanted to have this inaccessible. Um, then if you run the BPF programs from inside the pod, you don't really have access to the layer seven host proxy that we have in Cilium, that we have with the Envoy. So you could really only do layer three, layer four, policy enforcement, um, some of the service handling, uh, yeah. But then the other question is, okay, with IP VLAN, you have to pick one IP VLAN uh, master device, which is usually a physical device. And then what happens when there are multiple physical devices? Um, so those were some of the limitations. One thing that we probably could have done better in Cilium would be well, if we don't attach the BPF programs inside the pod, one other option could be that we attach it to the physical device on the TC egress hook, um, because that's where then all the traffic that is going out would be enforced. And instead of the of the L3, L3S default mode, we could have used L3 on L3S private mode, which means that um, there's no cross traffic between IP VLAN 0 and IP VLAN 1 device. Uh, all the traffic basically somehow has to like has to be forced out um, out of the pod. Uh, so then basically the the idea was to attach or like to have like a large tail call map for the BPF programs um, that you would have on the TC egress hook. But actually one problem with that is in the case of Cilium, we have enforcement that when a pod sends out traffic. Um, the BPF program that is attached on that container is checking the source IP address. And if there's traffic that is that it has not the expected source IP address, we will drop that so to, in order to prevent spoofing. And I think that's quite, uh, I'm not sure whether that's actually possible to do here in this case, because uh, like the IP VLAN internal code will basically look at the destination where traffic has to be routed, and then it will just route it out. But then uh, you don't have a concrete um, attachment point where you where you can uh, be sure that the the, the source um, came from that particular part. So you would have to look at the tuple. Um, yeah. And one thing I I, I haven't really tried, uh, but like if you would want to be able to support multiple uh, uh, physical devices, which is the case that a lot of Solium users have a uh, dual port or even more, um, then I believe, um, I'm not too familiar with, uh, with IP VLAN in that context, but I believe one thing you would have to do, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that you would have to attach this to a dummy device or like make a dummy device, the master device, and redirect the traffic there into the pods. So yeah, anyway. How does this all compare together? So we have Weave devices, IP VLAN, and NetKit devices. The Weave device operating in L2 mode. Um, IP VLAN and NetKit both L3. Then Weave devices come in a pair. Uh, the IP VLAN one, as I just described, it has like one physical master device and then different slave devices that are attached to this master device. Um, and the NetKit also comes in a pair. I, I, I think this model of having like pair devices is quite nice and flexible. Um, BPF programming, so for the Weave and IP VLAN case, we basically have the TC, TCX, where you have to uh, attach BPF programs, um, ideally on the host, because you really don't want to have applications inside the pod messing around with that. And routing, I mean, in case of the Weave, you have the, well, it's it's like given it's a uh, layer two, it's you, you, that's basically the, the next hop, the default gateway that you go through and then whatever you have inside the kernel, where you look up the kernel FIP, either through BPF or the upper routing, 
in the case of IPVLAN, it basically has this internal FIP so that it knows um, if the destination of the packet is like one of the uh, IPVLAN slave devices and if it matches the, the addresses, it will forward them there. And if that's not the case, um, so if that lookup fails, it will basically fall back to the kernel FIP uh, and then do the routing through uh, for packets that are going out of the node. And in the case of the NetKit device, um, it's it's optional what you what you do. I mean, uh, you can utilize the BPF FIP lookup from the kernel side to um, to get all the uh, addresses you need. So, yeah, um, problems. So, in, in in case of the Weave device, uh, I can I will show this later on some uh, benchmarks. So, like this, there's still this overhead there with, where you have the per CPU backlog queue that you need to go through. Uh, you need neighboring resolution. Like in Cilium, we had an ugly hack uh, where we basically have an ARP responder in BPF to force the traffic out to, to keep it simple. Um, and there's also this XTP mode where I'm not quite sure, like, um, I mean, it's it's useful for debugging and, and testing. Still hard to use. You need to have XTP attached on both devices. And I'm not quite sure, I mean, yeah, up to the use case, I think, where people need it. Um, and then with the IP VLAN, what, what we basically found were those inflexibilities I described earlier. Um, on the NetKit, uh, there are still some to-dos that I will go into later to elaborate more on that. Um, if you look at flame graphs in terms of the backlog queue, so really in the worst case that can happen, uh, with the Weave device, you defer to the case of the AQ daemon, so basically it enqueues and then at some point it picks it back up to process it further. And with the NetKit device, the idea is really simple, given you need to, given you do the FIP lookup from the pod, uh, for, like from the pod's peer device uh, with BPF, you can say, okay, if this traffic is destined to be routed out, you can directly forward it, so it will also help in terms of better accounting for the, for the scheduler. Uh, in terms of performance, so looking at the TCP single stream uh, performance, uh, we are basically on par with the host. And the same of the same if you look at the latency, so P99 latency here uh, for the request response type workloads, it's also the also on par. Ongoing work, um, so obviously, so some low hanging fruit, uh, IPR2 support patch has been sent out and I think there's some one or two more revisions needed. But the basic idea here with the IP route 2 is you set up the, the, the devices, you, you also get the information back how it was configured. That the BPF attachment itself, that's out of scope. Uh, that is basically for the application, for the application using libbpf or using the eBPF Go library. And the other plan that I have is to basically add support for the, for the Go-based Netlink library. So that one here is very popular and the most frequently used, I believe, uh, so that it will also support the device creation, which we need for the Cilium CNI plugin because it's written in Go. Um, the next one is uh, fixing networking statistics uh, for NetKit. So that <laughs> hasn't initially been implemented. Uh, patches are now out on the mailing list. Uh, and also helping to fix the, the peer redirection uh, statistics because one thing um, that uh, ByteDance folks reported was basically they were running C Advisor, which is a project from, from Google to basically gather all the statistics from the devices and export it somewhere for visibility. And that was uh, not implemented with the peer redirection. Um, Jacob uh, suggested to move that allocation of the, of the stats into the core, which is now uh, the, the case. And we basically, um, have NetKit and also Weave devices both use the T-stats. T-stats are basically there for Rx and Tx um, statistics for packets and bytes so that this can be allocated there and then uh, the devices will do their thing. And the SKB do redirect will basically bump the Rx uh, stats on the peer device inside the pod. Um, the next thing after that, I will be looking into is uh, there was a suggestion also from Jacob to basically uh, add a, just a pointer into the main uh, net device structure of the kernel for peer devices. 
um, it will help uh, to, ba to basically, I mean, it, it, it would basically, uh, right now, both Reef and NetKit, they have this in their private data structure, and moving it out of this in general uh, would help with removing the indirect call. Like on the on the SKB do redirect peer, there's an, there's an indirect call that we have, and uh, as a quick fix, there's uh, I, I've been using the indirect call macro, but that is limited when the device is only built in, but otherwise, if, it, if it's a module, you cannot really use it. So there's one limitation that moving this peer device into the net device structure would overcome. And the other thing, <clears throat> I, I don't have data on it yet. Uh, I implemented it before LPC, but I, but I will uh, do performance testing afterwards. But one thing that is interesting, what I saw from the, from, uh, some of the OBS work, um, I think that Paolo did uh, some time ago, is that when you add a VX line device or uh, like some other tunnel device in, 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 onto the OBS bridge, it will basically also adjust the needed headroom for all the attached port devices onto that so that you can potentially avoid uh, some reallocation uh, given VX line in Geneve, they need more headroom than your default direct routing. And uh, similarly, uh, also need a tail room. That is actually the case for WireGuard. It, it has non-zero tail room because it adds some padding at the end. Um, uh, so I'm, yeah, if the performance numbers look good, I was thinking to maybe have actually in the RT Netlink um, two new attributes so you can actually also dump it for the devices to introspect how much they need and you can, that you would also be able to set it. So that the idea is basically um, we would set it from the primary device and it will basically um, adjust this also for the peer device. So um, in internally it will see which of the two devices needs, needs the max headroom or tail room and then it will propagate this and set this on both. And from the mailing list, like uh, some of the old patches, they, they mentioned like a performance improvement from 5%. So I think it looks promising to, to set up, uh, you know, performance benchmarking and, and look into what effect it has today. Um, then, oh, okay, okay, fair enough. Okay, I will hurry up. Um, the next one, uh, I was thinking a new NDO for doing something very similar for the big TCP so that you can set um, the GSO max sizes for IPv6 and IPv4. The idea here would be also that uh, for big TCP um, users that would want to enable this on a running cluster, um, they don't have to restart pods because right now uh, it cannot be configured for both devices, right? So right now it's just on a per device basis and Cilium cannot really uh, go into the pod network namespace. So with that uh, limitation, it, it, this could be overcome. Uh, then there are some small difference in the, in the redirect peer handling. So for the Weave devices, if you would have like a local pod to pod communication, <clears throat> Um, the, the idea is basically on the weave to use the redirect peer also for the, uh, if you want to have traffic going to the other pod, so you only have like a single um, uh, time where you go to the per CPU backlog queue. And for the net kit, it's slightly different. Um, it's maybe more like of a documentation awareness uh, thing, but I will also look into if whether something else could be done with that. Um, some other future work. Um, I would actually love to get Jacob's opinion on that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, looking at looking into the BPF FIP lookup for IPv6 in particular, because IPv6 can be built as a module. The problem there is we have in the really worst case four indirect calls in that single helper, so that's really insane. Uh, in the regular case, I think it should probably be more like two indirect calls, but that's something we can improve performance-wise. And maybe the, the idea is like to just have IPv6 going from the tri-state to, 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 to like the Boolean. So it is always being built in for the majority of uh, users. And then we can get rid of the indirect calls, which would be nice. Um, then, okay, I'm soon out of time. 
for ammo. <laughs> then uh, one more thing is like the, the improvements around TCB dump uh, debugging. Um, that's on the, on the to-do list. Uh, re reorganizing the NDOs. It's kind of like semi-related, but uh, Coco from Google, he started some work to have like the fast path uh, uh, fields in the core networking data structures better grouped so that you can reduce the cache line access to that. And I think it would be nice, the next logical step, I think, would be to also do the same for the net device ops. Um, single device mode. Um, this could be something further out in the future. I was thinking um, the BPF dev map could potentially be used for that so that there's like a pointer to the to the device inside the pod. And then you can get rid of having one device in the in the host namespace. Um, yeah, that's something further out. Uh, and then indirect calls, getting rid of indirect calls in the BPF mproc when we execute the BPF programs. That would also be useful for XTP itself once we would be able to support multiple XTP programs. Um, so we need to look into the BPF dispatcher to be able to support that. And yeah, that's like the complete picture, how it looks. And with that, I'm done. <laughs>